Hello, my name is Andy and I am the Village Idiot. I'm armed with a car and a GoPro and an unhealthy amount of time on my hands. I'm using that time to attempt to visit every civil parish in England. You're watching the East Riding of Yorkshire series. Together with the unparished city of Hull, it forms the county of the same name. There's 172 parishes here. Which one are we in today? Welcome back to the East Riding of Yorkshire, folks. Now today I'm beginning on a street called St Martin's Close and at the end of St Martin's Close, as you can see, we have a playground. Not a very big one, but it's got a few things. A slide, for example, just there. That's one of the things you can see. But annoyingly, this playground has got a big wire fence around it. And the reason that's annoying is because this would have been a circular route if I was able to walk sort of through that fence and onto the road that's beyond. Annoyingly, I've got a linear bit to contend with because of that, but you know, no matter. Welcome to the lovely Fangfoss. Here's my disclaimer for people who may be watching me for the first time. I say things as I would in my native accent and dialect. As a result, I may not pronounce things in the same way as the locals do. Remember, I'm a visitor. It's impossible to know everything. Leave me a comment, spin me a like and bash that subscribe button. Let's get to today's parish video. Welcome to the delightful little village of Fangfoss, which is situated approximately 11 miles to the east of the city of York. Its boundaries include the hamlets of Spittal and Bolton, which both lie to the south. Fangfoss itself lies on gently shelving land between the Wolds Escarpment and the lower parts of the Vale of York. It's drained by Fangfoss Beck, which runs adjacent to Highfield Lane, the main road through the village. It's this that perhaps accounts for the Foss part of its name. Fangfoss was apparently an Anglian settlement. Historically another farming community, the open fields around the village were used as meadow and pasture, whilst the low sandy area in the west of the parish once formed an extensive common. Fangfoss has some very unusual landmarks. One of them would be Fangfoss Pottery, which occupies a former village school, and another is a rocking horse shop. Where else have we seen one of those, I ask you? There's several notable buildings too, like Fangfoss Hall, a square mansion that stands behind the parish church. There's two former chapels to see too, and even a sundial. Among the things that Fangfoss is famous for would be Fangfest, an annual celebration of the practical arts held every September. Things like pottery, craft, arts and scarecrows are all on display. Let's see what else was on display in March. Here's Fangfoss. We start by driving into Fangfoss through two small hamlets which sit to the south of the village. These are Spittal and Bolton. Spittal has always been associated with Fangfoss, but Bolton, where we are now, has not. Bolton was its own parish until it was abolished in 1935 and merged with Fangfoss to form what we have today. Spittal, as the name suggests, was the site of an ancient hospital, but not much is known about it. It wasn't mentioned in any records until 1342. It is known, however, that the hospital has held the estate, which was called Fangfoss Spittal Manor from 1507 until the dissolution of the monasteries. Some meadowland was sold in the 1540s to William Ramsden, and the rest of the estate was let by the Crown, generally for short terms. No more is known of the estate than that. Between Spittal and Fangfoss is a small beck, although you wouldn't necessarily know it was there. The watercourses in this area historically form the boundaries. Thank you. 
Our walk starts at St Martin's Close, named for the local church. The school here is also called St Martin's and we'll see that on this route. The fact that St Martin's Close has a play area at the end of it apparently doesn't stop the local children playing in the street. This board warns cars to slow down. This is Station Road. As its name suggests, Fangfoss once had a railway station, which again we'll be taking a closer look at later. This leads us onto Highfield Lane and this is the centre of the village. Fangfoss Beck runs alongside this for a short way, it drains the area around the village. A lot of traffic passes through the village between York and Pocklington. As such, Highfield Lane is quite a busy road. It doesn't really show you what the rest of Fangfoss is really like. The village has no shops, but there is a pub here. So too is a luxury B&B named Hillcroft. Well, we are on the Yorkshire Wolds after all. So you've probably worked out already that this is quite a noisy village on the main road. Well, thankfully, Fangfoss is not all about the main road. There are some quieter areas. If we go down this path here, this will take us to one of them. It will take us towards the church. The path leads to Main Street and a small triangular green. This is the oldest part of the village. In front of us here we have the church and the entrance to Fangfoss Hall. The hall is a large square mansion made of brick. We can't walk up this drive because it's a private road, but luckily we are still able to see this. The best place to get a good look at it is from the churchyard. Fangfoss Hall was built in 1766 and was made a Grade 2 listed building in 1967. The church has a memorial stone within it to several members of the Overend family who were formerly seated at Fangfoss Hall. Dedicated to St Martin, the church is a small stone edifice consisting of a chancel, a nave, a south porch and a western turret containing two bells. Rebuilt in the Norman style in 1849, it stands on the site of a former 12th century church. The current porch is partly rebuilt with stones from the old church. Okay, so there doesn't appear to be a light switch in here, unless I've just missed where it's located. Um, so yeah, it's going to be fairly dark, this bit, I'm afraid. Um, it's quite a, a nice little church. It's uh, small. The ceiling's still quite tall, though, as you can see. If I just tilt the camera up, you'll see. It's a long way up there. There's some nice stained glass in the chancel. There's a couple of tablets on the wall. There's one to my left here, if I just spin the camera around a second. You can see that is a war memorial tablet. Some nice stained glass next to that as well, right there. So uh, let's pick the camera up and we'll wander into the chancel and we'll see what else we can find in here. I do know there's a, a kitchen and a toilet here as well. You don't find that in every church. It's uh, quite helpful when you do find it. Well, especially for me anyway, when I'm walking around, you know, sometimes I have to have to improvise when it comes to uh, toilet facilities. So uh, no problem today. Let's wander into the uh, chancel. There's an organ on the left, just here. There we go. And there's a couple more tablets next to this on the wall. Let's see what these say. So the one on the bottom says, the gates of this church were given in loving memory of Vera Constance Fawcett, 1916 to 1986. Oh, go your way into his gates with thanksgiving. And the one above it is to do with the lights in the chancel, uh, given in memory of Rose Ellen Fawcett. So if there are lights in the chancel, I don't know where the switch is. <laughs> oh, hang on a minute, it might be over there. Let's see. No, it's not, that's not a light switch. Well, it'll be in here somewhere anyway. So yeah, um, this, is the, uh, this is the church here in Frankfurt. There's also a lectern here, pulpit this side, standard church furniture, I suppose, font on the left there, and uh, yeah, the kitchen and the uh, toilet at the back. Uh, it says on the door that this church is open every day from 9 a.m. until 3 p.m. So uh, yeah, if you fancy coming to see the church here, then get yourself here, you have no excuse.
there are plenty of landmarks on Main Street. How about this rocking horse shop? You don't see this every day. I've linked their website below. Next, we have a sundial standing close to the green. I couldn't find much about this, but it's a nice little feature all the same. Next, let's check out Fangfoss Pottery. The pottery was established in 1977 and is one of the leading studio potteries in Yorkshire. The business occupies the village's former national school, which was built in 1867. It stands on the site of an older school, which was also a meeting place for Wesleyan Methodists. As a school, it was closed by 1950 and the pupils were transferred to Pocklington. Continuing down Main Street, next up we have an old red phone box. There's no prizes for guessing what this one is used for. After this, we pass a former chapel. Now, what an attractive little building this is. This was a Wesleyan chapel. Built in 1865, this replaced the former meeting place that Fangfoss Pottery now stands on. Well, I can't fault anything I've seen here so far. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's absolutely fantastic. And a rocking horse shop. You don't find them everywhere, do you? They're rare as something else to do with rocking horses. Okay, <laughs> now we've reached the pub. It's the Carpenter's Arms. Let's talk a bit about that. And the school is directly opposite this too. It may well be older, but the first recorded mention of the Carpenter's Arms was in 1823, when the landlord was also reportedly the village carpenter, hence the name. Outside the school, we have the parish notice board. Now, guess who left his cards in the car once again? No matter, 93 down, 79 to go. If you need a bus, this is the place to catch it in Fangfoss. The village is served by the 747, and no, that's not an aircraft. It runs between York and Pocklington. Here then is the current school, which was built in 1971 beside the Pocklington Road. A small school, this was catering for just 32 pupils in the early 70s. Now for the most challenging part of this walk. We need to go up back lane towards Jubilee Park next, which is the main recreational space here. You can't drive up here, it's pedestrian access only. It's worth the walk though. Jubilee Park has quite an interesting backstory. So because this is pedestrian access only, it's quite a, a long walk down here. Mind you, it is pleasant enough. Um, there's some good views across there, so I suppose it's worth the walk. And to be honest with you, I wouldn't want to take my car down here anyway, because as you can see, there's plenty of potholes. Welcome then to Jubilee Park, which is quite a walk out of the main village along Back Lane. This was created in 2002 to mark the Golden Jubilee of Queen Elizabeth II. Before this existed, this was simply a barren field which had been used as pasture for decades. Thanks to changing patterns in economic and leisure activities in the countryside, this land became more useful for recreation and wildlife. It's got everything you would want in a park. It features a big level patch known as the Kickabout area, plenty of play equipment and benches, and there's even some artwork. Check out this amazing little mosaic. As we leave the park behind, we cross a little stream, which is linked to Ornham's Beck near Garraby. All this water eventually ends up in the Humber. And back to Highfield Lane, our last landmark is the former Primitive Methodist Chapel. Dating back to at least 1865, more recently, this has been used as a furniture workshop. And we're almost back to the start here, but as you can see, this is what I was talking about earlier. You can see over there, the fence to the right, which surrounds the little play area where I began. I'm on a path here that's down the side of that chapel I've just shown you. If there was a gap through there, this would be very simple to walk back to the car, but there isn't, which means I've got to walk all the way around back past the school and onto St. Martin's Close to get back to the car. Very annoying. Anyway, that's been the parish of Frankfoss, although there is one more thing we still do need to talk about, and that's the old railway station. From 1847, Fangfoss was served by Fangfoss Railway Station on the York to Beverly line. In 1987, the station house, which still stands, was given a Grade 2 listing. 
Frank Foss had staggered platforms. If you know where to look, you can still see some evidence of these. Peering through these trees, you can see part of one of them. Some of the railway signs are still visible as well. The station would close to passengers in 1959 and then completely with the rest of the line in 1965. Frank Foss Station was used a great deal during World War II for troop movements and also for transporting livestock and agricultural goods over a much longer period. There was also a signal box located at Frank Foss which controlled access to a goods yard which was close by as well as crossing gates over the road. These days the station site has been turned into Fang Foss Park, a caravan park and campsite which covers some four and a half acres with 75 pitches. And that's been the parish of Fangfoss, folks. Time for me to move on to my next one here in the East Riding of Yorkshire. And for the next batch, I will stay on the Wolds. There's some good ones coming up, including one with a very infamous name, shall we say? You'll see where that is when I eventually get there. I've been Andy, also known as the Village Idiot, and this has been the parish of Fangfoss, and I'm out.